I'm Jordan. And I'm Tyler. And this is the Inside Music City Podcast. Welcome to another episode of Inside Music City, where it's our job to talk to music industry professionals about the ins and outs of the music business. This episode is brought to you by our wonderful patrons. Yay! Thanks, guys. You can learn more about becoming part of the Patreon family, as well as finding a lot of behind-the-scenes content by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash Inside Music City. Our guest today is Dave Pomeroy. Dave is an incredibly inventive bass player who has traveled the world and won tons of awards. He's worked with artists like Sting, Elton John, Johnny Cash, Garth Brooks, Willie Nelson, Faith Hill, the list goes on and on. And not only that, he worked his way up the ladder to become the president of the Nashville Musicians Association, AFM Local 257. In this episode, we talk about his journey as a bass player, some fun memories playing with Elton John and Willie Nelson, and how he came to be the president of the Musicians Union. We also dive into the all-bass orchestra that he created, his solo album, and so much more. In the show notes, you can find links to everything we talk about, as well as where to learn more about Dave and his projects. We hope that you enjoy our conversation with Dave Pomeroy. Dave, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be here. Yeah, I'm glad uh, we were able to find a time to sit down together. I wanted to start out with how you chose Nashville. Well, you know, I was an Air Force kid, so we lived a lot of places when I was young. I was born in Italy. We lived in uh, uh, England for three years from 1961 to 64. And as a very young child, it was pretty fascinating to watch all the activity on the British television, uh, you know, with these guys with long hair running around looking like they're having a really big time previous to the Ed Sullivan show. So even as a young kid, I, I, I got the bug just from watching the Beatles and uh, ended up coming back to the States, and, and uh, after my second year of college, I had an opportunity to go to Europe. My dad was stationed at NATO headquarters in Belgium, so I had the logical thought process of, okay, well, I'll quit college and go to London and become a rock star, and then we'll see what happens after that. And so I did go to London. I did get in a band, uh, got in a few bands, got a work permit, stayed there for a year, did not become a rock star. Uh, but my... Uh, my friend Mary Riles, uh, now Mary Bomar, who uh, I had worked with in college in my second year, we'd been in a band together, and she had moved to Nashville and had met a few people and had some stuff going. And after being in London, England for a year, I didn't want to go back to a local music scene. And so I thought LA, New York, or Nashville, and I didn't know anybody in New York or LA. So I came here first to check it out for a couple of weeks. And this fall, it'll be 40 years. It's hard to believe. Wow. <laughs> so tell us a little more about your. Um 1960s England experience with watching yeah, all well, the bands? Yeah, uh, you know, I was the youngest of three kids, so, you know, you're constantly trying to sort of see what everybody else is doing. And, and you know, starting around mid-1962, uh, suddenly the Beatles were everywhere. Shows like Top of the Pops and Thank Your Lucky Stars. And, and you know, they were just, I mean, it, it was the biggest thing uh, that had happened in England culturally in a long time. And so it planted a seed. I don't, I hadn't really put together the idea of like being a professional musician at all. Uh, but there was just, it just, it, there were, it like, plan, I, I literally say it planted a seed uh, in that I, I just, I think my first thought was, boy, those guys sure like they're having a good time. And I didn't think about it much more till then. And then when we came back to the States, um, you know, I took some piano lessons because that's what everybody was supposed to do. And, and I was okay at it, although I, I think I was already intrigued with trying to play by ear a little bit and get away from the rented, the printed page. Um, but I played the clarinet in fourth grade and fifth grade, uh, which will be 50 years ago this fall. Uh, our, my school started a string orchestra as well as the band that they already had. So I was playing clarinet in the band, and they invited any of the kids, including those in the band that were interested, to, to come, you know, uh, you know, uh, ask about it and uh, essentially apply to be in the orchestra. And so I, somehow or another, I got it in my head that I, I wanted to play the cello. I had no logic or whatsoever. And so I went in and I talked to Mrs. Christie, who was the lady who was actually the wife of the band director, which was interesting. And, and I just, you know, I said, hey, you know, I, I think I want to play the cello. And she said, well, we already have quite a few cello players and, and you have big hands, so maybe you should 
play the bass. And I, my first thought was like, okay, what's a bass? And and then there was a string bass sitting over in the corner, and it was literally that kind of oh kind of thing. And you know, and after the the rays of sunshine, you know, went away, <laughs> I started. And I think another part of my thought was everybody will notice me if I'm carrying this big thing around. I think that was maybe part of it too, a little bit of ego in there, uh, not realizing that having an ego and being a bass player is not very helpful. Um, I found that out later, uh, and so I. It took me another year or two before I figured out that the string bass was essentially the same thing that Paul McCartney and right around that same time Jack Bruce uh, was playing. And I went, oh, okay. And that's when I started getting interested in the bass guitar uh, at the age of maybe 12, sixth grade. And so I uh, mowed yards for a summer and I got $50 for the whole summer and I bought a bass for $42, uh, Kingston electric bass and started playing it and drove my parents crazy and they realized I was pretty serious about it and then seventh grade um, I'd moved on to junior high and I had some sort of falling out with the string teacher for some reason that I can't remember and I remember going to my parents it was similar to the way it was when I told them I was quitting college and I I just said you know I really want to get a good electric bass and I'm not going to play this old dinosaur thing anymore and so can we take this and trade it in? So we went to Zavarella's Music in D.C. and Alexandria. And and I was pretty much limited to what was in the store that day. And there was a, uh, a Fender that was what they would call the Fender 5, which was a short string with a high C string, which seemed a little oddball. And then there was a Gibson bass, an EB-2 hollow body. And, and Jack Bruce had already become my hero by this point, and, and Jack was playing at Gibson. So there was no question I was going to get the Gibson, and I still have that bass. And, and I just started playing in bands and just figuring, making it up as I went along. And uh, it, it's, it's been pretty amazing. <laughs> and I still play the string bass. I never could get away from it. It always came back. <laughs> You said you still have that bass, yeah, the original one. Yeah, I have a. I, yeah, I actually just uh, did a photo shoot recently and, and picked it up. I. It's funny when I first came to Nashville, and and of course Gibson basses were very taboo in the seventies in for, in terms of Nashville and recordings and session musicians. It was like you know get you a Fender son kind of thing, and and so I had. I but I really wanted a fretless bass, and so I had a friend who worked at a music store, pull the frets out of it, which was a terrible idea because Gibsons don't have a lot of top end to begin with. and So it sat for a very long time under the bed, and then maybe uh, 20 years ago or so, I had a friend that worked at Gibson, and I took it over to Gibson, and they pretty much restored it to its original uh, shape. But yeah, it was a 67 uh, EB2, and I bought it in 1969. So I don't know who, who had it the first two years, but uh, it's definitely my baby. And now, of course, it's okay to play a Gibson because yeah. things have changed. It only took 40, 50 years. <laughs> That's all. So you've been playing bass for a really long time. Did you ever come to a point where you wanted to quit? No, I think I hit the wall a few times in terms of, you know, like just not knowing what to do next. Sometimes uh, more from a business standpoint than from a playing. I think the the playing part of it has always been so um, pure and just like uh, attractive to me, you know, just, just, you know, the very act of, of playing. And e- even now it's still the best therapy I've ever, ever had. And um, so I, I definitely got discouraged a few times. I definitely felt like, wow, I'm, I'm hitting up against all I can do in this situation and I think a big art of uh, a big part of the art of being a successful musician, or, or perhaps in any uh, profession, it's knowing when to move on, knowing when to say, "Okay, I've taken this situation as far as I can, and and now I'm going to see what else is out there." So I've certainly had those kind of crossroads, uh, you know, moving to Nashville, moving to London, uh, all those decisions. But even within that, you just there's an innate feeling inside of like. I think I'm done with this. And and then it's a question of, okay, can I make a graceful exit? And how can I do that? But I think the, the music has never let me down. The The business has been frustrating a time or two. And, and I think getting discouraged is frankly part of the artistic process. How, how did you choose what to do next? Well, that's a great question. I think really just looking at my surroundings and, and sort of just 
deciding which of these options that are presenting themselves might be the best move, knowing that each time you take a fork in the road, it leads to something else. And so I never felt like any of the decisions I made were irreversible, and I felt most of them were hopefully going to be leading somewhere. And occasionally it's just you learn what you don't want to do. But uh, for the most part, I've been very fortunate to have some seemingly random occurrences turn into really, really great business moves. <laughs> Yeah, and we can see uh, those those business moves, especially on your website. You've listed um, over a hundred of different musicians and artists that you've worked with and that you've played with. Um, do you have any cool experiences with performing with so many musicians? Oh Studio gosh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think one of probably one of the favorite moments of my entire career was going to Atlanta with Earl Scruggs and recording a song with Elton John. Um, Earl, uh, Earl's son Randy, a uh, great guitarist and producer, Randy had started using me on some things he was producing, and, and uh, including his solo record. And Earl had been through some uh, uh, pretty serious medical issues and was kind of making a comeback. And, and one of the first things that we did was a, uh, a recording for uh, Randy's record uh, of Wildwood Flower with Emmylou Harris and Iris DeMent and Earl. And, you know, I'm just blown away. I mean, I saw the Beverly Hillbillies as a kid. I never in my life thought I'd ever play with a banjo player, let alone that banjo player. So, and Earl was an incredibly humble guy and just a beautiful spirit. And, and so, and, and I had worked with both Emmy Lou and Iris in different situations. And, but when we went down to Atlanta, we were doing this album, Earl Scruggs and Friends. And, uh, and so it was different songs with different people. And, and, uh, and so they had approached Elton, who was a fan. And so we, it was decided before we went down there that we would do Country Comforts, which is one of my very favorite Elton John songs. Uh, I was always a little more of a fan of the early stuff. And so we took a bus and we all drove down there. And Earl and Louise drove down in their Cadillac, or Lincoln, I think it was. And we meet at the studio, and, and then Elton shows up, and you know, with a little bit of an entourage, but he was definitely on his best behavior, not a diva at all. Mm -hmm. And and we set up, and the way we were set up in the studio, I was like literally about four or five feet away from him. But the angle I was at, I couldn't see his left hand, but I could at least see his body language. And so it was really interesting because, you know, he's going, oh, I haven't played this song in a while. And he's like re remembering how it goes. And, and the song has quite a bit of left hand syncopation and, and things and so we finally got to the point where we were uh, you know starting to cut it and first take was one way and and I I kind of was in the position because we had a chart but he was doing things with the left hand that really affected where I needed to be and interesting enough the guy who played bass on the original record uh, was in Alton's band at the time D Murray who played them for a long time and D had ended up moving to Nashville we had become friends. He was a very nice guy, and he had passed away quite a bit before this. So, it, you know, it was a song that I knew the bass part by heart because I'd already, I loved that song, I loved that guy, and so I, and I'd done a little research. So, so I knew what the bass part on the record was. I was going to do my own thing with it uh, at some point. Uh, but the three takes that we did, each one, Elton played a completely different left hand part. And on the third take, I made a bunch of guesses and they all worked out and nothing rubbed and I didn't have to fix anything, which was a great, you know, that's, you don't want to be that guy going, yeah, I know it's a take, but I got to fix something. I'm sorry. You know, you don't want to be that guy. And so it worked out and then we hung around and Elton did the vocal. And I remember there was a kind of a, a bit of a, a, a problem because they, he was overdriving the mic pre's and they had to try a bunch of different mic pre's and microphones to get something that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, uh, overdrive. And he was being very, very patient, very, my uh, very much his best behavior and gets the vocal. And then, uh, we all get in, we're going to take a picture. And I remember he had a box set of flat and scrugs that he got Earl to sign. And we all took a picture and, and Earl's wife, Louise sat on Elton's lap with a big grin on her face and Louise was an incredible businesswoman and was known for being very businesslike. And so it was definitely the biggest smile I ever saw on her face. And when it was all over, Elton and his people went on and, you know, I'm just in, I'm just in a daze of happiness, you know. And so Earl is standing next to the water cooler and, 
kind of looking off into space. And I came up and said, Earl, I just want to say thank you for this incredible opportunity to do this. You know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just totally kind of going all, you know, a little overboard with it. And he just looks at me and waits for me to finish. And then he goes, no, thank you, Dave. <laughs> and I was like, Wow. Earl Scruggs is like the coolest guy in, in the universe. So that that's probably one of my definite favorites. Uh, we did a great uh, record with Willie Nelson uh, for the Chris Christopherson tribute uh, album called The Pilgrim. And, and we cut a song that uh, was just gorgeous. And, and it was one of those things, okay, we're going we're gonna to fade. We're, we're going to fade. And so we same thing. We did just a couple of takes because, you know, when it's guys like that, I mean, they get right to it. And as a session musician, your job is to, like, you got to get to that level and stay there with them. And, and you, you put your fan, your fan club membership, you know, in your back pocket and you just get in there and do it. And Willie's always been great every time I've worked with him. Uh, but this particular thing, we'd planned on a fade and everybody just kept playing. And then we just all came to a beautiful ending all together without a single word being spoken. And, and we all went in there and, and me and one other guy listened to it and thought we were going to fix something. And then once we listened to it, we were like, I can fix that. We're going to leave it just like it is. Some of the best records I've ever played on, I think, were like that. Keith Whitley, Trisha Yearwood, they were both incredible singers who just nailed it. And it was like, and it just lifts everybody up to that level. Um, you know, just so I've just been uh, so, so fortunate, you know, and to get to work with some of these people who are your heroes. Steve Winwood, one of the nicest guys you'd ever meet in your life. I mean, if anybody had a right to cop an attitude, it would be him. But he has he's a total nice person and i was his band leader for one a gig uh at the songwriter festival tin pan south and i remember writing a chart for higher love and being really proud to get the whole thing on one page because it's a very it's got a lot of sections and and it's a fade on the record so i'd written out a little ending and and so you know we run a couple of tunes it's like okay we're gonna do higher love uh steve you know it's a fade on the record as i know you know and uh you know i've got an ending here if you want to try that but you know if you've got a way you like to end it on stage you know, just let me know and, and he just looked at me and he said oh whatever you think Dave and it's like you're Steve Winwood <laughs> how can you say that to me <laughs> whatever you think Dave <laughs> and I and I said well let's try my little thing and we tried the end he goes oh it's lovely and I'm just like wow how did that happen so uh, there's many many stories but w what's so awesome about all of these is that it's people you know, they're, they're, even though they're stars, even though they're incredibly talented, they're still people. And they have all the same qualities that other people have. And, and to kind of, you know, step out of the fan part and, and, uh, of yourself and just and be a, a peer and a co-worker, is, it's, it's a real privilege. But it also speaks volumes to uh, maybe how, uh, you know, how those people came to be so famous and came to be so great was that, you know, they're just like a light that shines and, and to be in that aura for a minute is very special. Speaking of all these stars and big names as just people, how, how can somebody even begin to start thinking about collaborating with musicians to work their way up to, I guess, the success level that you have? you've had well you know it's literally one door at a time every door leads to another door every fork in the road leads to another fork in the road and sometimes what seem to be the most insignificant events or encounters can lead to things um you know i i mean i so many of those stories i think what it's about is you you have to you have to be believe in yourself you know if you really truly want, you know, want to have a career in the music business, you know, you have to believe in yourself because if you don't, who else will? And I did not grow up in a musical family. I had to kind of fight for the, you know, the right to pursue this as a career because it was of great concern to my parents. My brother and sister were, you know, went to law school and became lawyers. And uh, so as a bass player, I was the automatic black sheep of the family. But I think it's really just about being open to and being observant to your environment and what's there and it's there's networking is you know a relatively new word um 
we used to call it hanging out, <laughs> uh, or, you know, and it can be schmoozing, which doesn't always have a great positive connotation. But really, I think it's just, you know, number one, you, you, you know, you need to go to the place where the kind of things you want to do are possible, which is why Nashville has been such a magnet. And we can talk about that, uh, you know, a little later about why it's Nashville and not some of these other cities, because I have very definite uh, feelings about that. But I think it's really just about make being honest with yourself. Uh, I had some good friends who helped me by going, hey, man, you're not really cutting it in this area. You need to work on this. And I'd be like, oh, wow, my friend just busted me. So I don't think he would do that for fun. So, yeah, I better go work on that. I better, you know, because when I first started doing sessions, I was kind of just trying to memorize the song, which is what I've been doing since I was a teenager. And I was sort of reading the chart, but not really. And my friend uh, Biff Watson said, hey, man, I see what you're doing. You need to work on that. And it was, he did it in a nice way. And, and I learned a lot of stuff from Biff over the years uh, and, and other people too. So, and I would say the other thing is you always try to work with people who are better than you are, who know more than you do, because you absorb that. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's, to me, that's probably the single most important thing is to be able to um, just be cognizant of your surroundings. And one of the most important lessons is to understand that every time you enter a new musical situation, there's psychology involved. You know, there's an alpha dog. There's a, there's a sit in the corner and complain person. There's a whiner. There's a passive aggressive. You know, there's all these different personality types, and we're not trained to be psychiatrists, but you have to figure out where the power is. And that just so that you direct your energy towards the right place, uh, more so than like sucking up the one guy and ignoring somebody else. It's, it's really more just being aware, especially as the new guy, you got to pick your spots. You don't go in there and just immediately start trying to take over the situation and tell everybody what to do. I've seen people do that. And, and I probably did it myself a time or two. And, and early on, I probably got called on it by one of my friends. And I went, oh, you know... I didn't think about that. You're right. So it's just, I think so much of it is just not having, just letting go of your preconceptions, you know, and not selling yourself short either. You know, when you walk into, you know, you've been booked on a session or you've been booked to do a gig with some people who are a lot more famous than you are. Maybe they're a lot more experienced than you are, but you got hired. So you're, you're an equal part in that. And, and, you got to, you know, get over your butterflies or your ego or whatever's getting in the way of getting in the zone because you got to get in the zone with everybody else. And I always tried to give 110 uh, percent, you know, to go that extra little bit. And at the same time, you, you learn to recognize it's just a base. Not everybody's as concerned with the minutia as I might be. And so after a while, I quit asking people if they thought I should use round wound or flat wound strings on this particular number, because frankly, most people don't care what the bass <laughs> is doing sound wise, as long as it's not screwing anything up. So I've learned to keep some of those, uh, you know, sonic debates to myself, but it's really just about people skills more than it is. I mean, there's a lot of great players, but nobody wants to hang out with somebody who's a jerk. Whereas a guy who might be a virtuoso, if he doesn't have the people skills or he doesn't know how to share, because it's, you know, make, making music is a creative sharing experience. I want to shift to Nashville specific. Okay. Um, you, let's start with where can people go if they're sort of new in town to learn where the locals go and hang out? That's a very good question. One of the more difficult things for me sometimes is to kind of project myself into the mind and, and of somebody who just got here because it's so different than it was when I came here. Uh, but there how are, do you mean? But there are, well, it, it, just in terms of the business has changed a lot and, you know, you make these connections and you know people and and inevitably, if you make enough of them, it begins to put itself together into a ability to make a living. But so it's hard for me to just sort of immediately put on the shoes of somebody who just came into town. But I think I, I think obviously you want to go out 
I mean, I can remember asking an older guy for advice, and he just said, go down on Broadway and buy people drinks. Mm -hmm. And I think it was his way of saying, spend all your money and get out of town because I'm already playing bass on a whole bunch of stuff, and we don't need you around here, kid. But mm -hmm. I was too naive to figure that out, so I probably I went downtown, and I bought people drinks and, and, and realized after a while that it's really not about buying people drinks. It's about making connections and meeting people. And, you know, it, it's... Uh, obviously, there there are clubs that are designed for tourists in Nashville, and then there are clubs that are uh, more for the Nashvillians. Um, you know, the Bluebird Cafe is an interesting case because it's gone from one of those little kind of inside places in a little club in the strip mall to being this iconic place that's now full of tourists every night. And if you wanted to go to the Bluebird Cafe as a local, you probably can't get in. Uh, but, you know, places like Douglas Corner, 3rd and Lindsley, 12th and Porter, which seems to go in and out of business every couple of years, <laughs> um, you know, but uh, those and, and, you know, songwriter nights. I mean, of course, a lot of it depends on what you're coming here trying to do. I came here with the only goal because it was the only goal I ever had was I just want to be in a band that people like. I didn't really understand what a session musician was. I didn't understand what a producer was, what a songwriter was, any of those things. Um, I just started mixing it up. So I think it's a question of you're looking for kindred spirits. You're looking for people who are maybe, again, just a little further down the road than you are. And maybe they've figured some stuff out and you can pick, your, pick their brain. Um, but, you know, a lot of people move here knowing one or two people. And, you know, and again, you, you just try to follow that through. The Station Inn, for people who are like in the acoustic music world, you know, Station Inn is an incredible place, and, and you can walk in there as a total stranger, and people are going to be nice to you. And so, uh, you know, if and I think anybody who is in that world of acoustic, folk, Americana, bluegrass, they probably already know about the Station Inn, and probably when they walk in, they go, wow, this place is tiny. And, of course, now it's in the middle of, like, when 40 years ago, it was in the middle of nowhere, and now there's all this stuff that has happened all around it development wise and so i think you know getting out and hearing bands meeting people i would go to songwriter nights and just listen and if i heard somebody who i thought was really good i would i would approach them afterwards and give them my card and just kind of say hey um you know i know you don't normally have a bass player on you know writers nights but i really like your stuff and and if i can ever help you that was always mine if i can ever help you here's my number I didn't say, if you could please get me a gig, or, you know, if you can ever pay me some money, <laughs> you know, it was just, hey, if I can help you, because that's really how I saw it. And it's like, and, and some of these artists, writers were people that went on to great success. And sometimes I was able to kind of piggyback and be a part of that. And if not, maybe I'd run into them in the studio years later and, and people remember stuff like that. They go, yeah, I remember you, you know, and, and. Only a few times did I ever really become a pest with somebody, and that was just because I thought they were so great that I was just really wanting to be their bass player. But, you know, I met Guy Clark through a random rehearsal in a basement with his drummer, who by sheer coincidence happened to be Willie Nelson's nephew. His mom is Bobby Nelson, Willie's sister that with the cowboy hat and the long hair that plays piano. And so, and we did this rehearsal and, and, you know, I'd only been in town a, a year or two and, 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 you know, he said, Hey, you know, uh, guy, you're a good bass player. Guy Clark's looking for a bass player. You want to play with Guy Clark? I'm like, yeah, cool. I, I, I think I've heard of him and not really knowing who he was or being familiar with his music. You know, I immediately went right to the record store and bought a couple of records and listened to it and tried to prepare. And three days later, I'm sitting in that very same basement with Guy Clark and with a gallon of wine and, and playing these songs one after another and just, you know, listening to them in sheer disbelief at the power and the simplicity of the words. And it was a real wake-up call for me because, you know, I was a very uh, aggressive bass player, very, you know, I rock and roll, man. I wanted to be Jack Bruce, you know, and set the world on fire with bass solos. And all of a sudden I'm sitting in a room with a, somebody with a guitar playing very primitive guitar stuff, but like, blowing my mind with the depth and the power and simplicity of that music and it was like a total reset and it, and I spent I spent the rest of my life going between 180 miles an hour and nothing because literally you could listen to guys music and go you don't need a bass player 
But of course, I wanted a job. So I played with Guy and Billy Joe uh, kind of simultaneously, Billy Joe Shaver. And, uh, and it was all because Freddie just liked my playing and B. Spears, who had been Willie Nelson's bass player for many years and somehow lost his mind and quit Willie to play with Guy briefly and then came back to his sanity and went back to playing with Willie. And I just, it was all timing, nothing but timing. I don't know if that answered your question, but it was yet another story. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, so we can shift gears a little bit. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about uh, the Nashville Musicians Association. Yeah. Um, what is it, and, and share your experience with that. Well, it's a, it's a very interesting organization. Um, the AFM, American Federation of Musicians, was founded in 1896, and the Nashville local was founded six years later in 1902, 115 years ago. And... Um, it has always been an organization that looks out for the interests of professional musicians. And Nashville, even despite its current growth spurt, is currently the 25th largest city in the U.S., and we have the third largest musicians union in the U.S. We have more members in our union than Chicago, Atlanta, um, St. Louis, San Francisco, other towns that you'd think would have much larger populations and would probably have bigger unions. But it's because there's always been a culture here, starting with the Grand Old Opry back in the 30s, you know, late 30s, early 40s, where, you know, that became sort of a magnet because, you know, there was not a lot of entertainment options back then. And the regional radio, you know, the uh, 10,000 watts or whatever it was, you know, it covered a, a large area because there weren't so many competing air signals. And so it became a little bit of a magnet, but really the big bang of Nashville as a music center came when when Sam Phillips sold Elvis's contract to RCA Records. And RCA opened up a Nashville office, selected Chet Atkins to run that office, and brought Elvis from Memphis to Nashville to record, starting with Heartbreak Hotel. And very quickly, Decca Records did the same thing, uh, picked... Uh, Owen Bradley, another great producer, arranger, piano player, to run that. And those two guys, along with a fellow named George Cooper, who was president here for 38 years, they made sure that when these big companies came to Nashville and used Nashville musicians, who were, you know, at that point, a very elite group of session players who later became known as the A-Team, uh, a, a lot of them were, were actually jazz players, uh, which was also true in other recording centers where the jazz guys had the vocabulary to become session players. And so George Cooper was was uh, right in step with Owen and Chet, and if there was a session and somebody was on the session that was new to town that wasn't a union member, George would go over to the studio and, hey, guys, give me a minute, and he'd clear the room, and he'd sit in the room with this guy and talk to him and, Okay, and I don't know, so you know, like you're going to come down and join the union, right? And it wasn't a strong arm thing as much of everybody else is doing this, and now you're here, you can be part of the team. And that's what's become, to me, the mantra of Nashville. It's like we're not, and the right to work state thing that happened in the late 40s just emphasizes that fact that you don't have to be a union member, but if you want to promote good things for musicians, you should be part of the team. And to be part of the team, you need to join the union and you pay your dues and we, it's our obligation to work for you and create uh, opportunities to protect your intellectual property. For me, I, I'd been literally been in town a month and I, uh, one day short of a month in town, somebody said, hey kid, you need to go join the union. I, I had no idea. I'm like, okay, what's that? Uh, where is it? You know, And I went down and joined. And it was a few years later, until I really began to understand what it was the union does and how it works. For me, the wake-up call was in, in uh, early 1980, I got a job with a singer named Don Williams, great country singer, iconic artist, really a folk singer with a cowboy hat, to, to tell the truth. But, uh, you know, an incredible guy, incredible singer, and I was working with him, and he was at the peak of his career. Uh, you know, he's, and so we played Giant Stadium. Uh, and, you know, for me... It's like, wow, we're playing Giant Stadium. I've, I've made it. I can, you know, my career is through now. I've, I've played Giant Stadium. It was, to me, that was more than enough. We got paid. Tom paid us very well. Unbeknownst to me, they were filming the show. 
And a couple months later, on a, a TV show called America's Top Ten with Casey Kasem, the old the DJ guy, um, sure enough, and here's this week's number one country single, Don Williams, I Believe in You, and it's us, a giant stadium. And it's like, wow, that's cool. And then I get paid, and it's like, and I get paid like m twice as much money as I made for the gig, and it's like, wow, okay. And that was in December of 1980, and then in January of 1980, they showed it again, and I got another. It was like a thousand bucks a pop, and and I was like, wow, how did that happen? So that's what the union does. You get paid for what you do. It's a television show. It's a major network television show. That number didn't fall out of the sky. That's what you make. And and then a few years later, we made an album with Don's band for MCA Records. And, and you know, I got to make a record, which, again, was like, I just got to make a record. I'm, my career is through, you know. And and I, we got paid for it. And, and we, you know, the record didn't really do anything. But we got to, uh, you know, do, Don would give us a spot in the show. And we did Austin City Limits. And, and so... You know, these opportunities happened, and, and I learned about it very gradually. And then as I started getting into recording work, then you kind of go, okay, well, it, you know, because at first you're like, you take anything and you work for free because you're just trying to get heard, you're just trying to meet people. And it's like, okay, well, like 20 bucks a song, okay, well, it's not great, but okay. And then 25 bucks a song, well, hey, we're getting better. And, you know, and, and then it's like, okay, 30 bucks a song, but you got to write all the charts and call all the players, which should be paying double, but it's only paying another $5 a song. But okay. And then finally get to the point where, okay, I'm actually doing a real union session. And, and, and then uh, my big break for that stuff came in 1985 when Don uh, went switched record labels and needed to get in the studio right away and make a new record. And the guy who played on his records, you know, all up to that time, a guy named Joe Allen, great bass player and also songwriter. Joe um, was on the road with Neil Young. Neil had just made a Nashville album and was touring with one of his spinoff bands. So I got the call to play on the record with guys like Kenny Malone and Jim Horn and Billy Sanford, the real session players. And, and, and it went great. And we had a number one single and all of a sudden I was on the radio. So that was when I really began to understand what the union does and and basically we negotiate contracts with the record industry with the movie industry the television industry the jingle industry uh we work with you know touring theater acts like the lion king goes on the road we have a contract for that um we symphony orchestras uh, all have their own contracts uh cbas we call them collective bargaining agreements and um, also the grand old opry and so you know, as you begin to work and you come up the ladder, you come down to the union and you pick up checks for the various work you do, and then something gets used somewhere else, kind of like that performance uh, from Giant Stadium, and that's called a new use. And it pays you again as if it's a new recording in whatever that new medium is. And so it was a very gradual process for me. And then as when I got off the road, with I was with Don for 14 years. Great experience. Um, but I, I was getting busier and busier because those sessions I did for Don led to sessions with Keith Whitley. Uh, and then, you know, again, on another fluke, I did some demos for Emmylou Harris's husband in their home studio and met Emmy Lou. And the next record she was going to make, she was going to, for the first time, co-produce her own record. And she was working with a guy named Richard Bennett, great producer who worked with Joel Sonnier and currently plays in Mark Knopfler's band. And they made a deal. Richard could pick the drummer, and Emmy Lou could pick the bass player. And of all the bass players in the world she could pick, she picked me. And I got to do this record, and, and, and it was still one of the favorite things I've ever done, an album called Bluebird. So as I got busier and busier, the road became kind of an escape from being really, really busy in town, as opposed to the early days when the road gig was all I had, and then you went home and you tried to get something going. you know. And I always did club gigs and different things of my own just to kind of always stay busy. But I got to the point where I got off the road and went full-time into sessions. And I did that for most of the 90s and the early part of the 2000s. And then starting around 2003, 2004, we started having issues uh, within our union. Uh, essentially, the leaders on the national level, the, the president had figured out that if you keep people fighting with each other, that you can always stay in power because no one can 
have the solidarity, you know, to overcome your all your little power groups because you're, you know, you're feeding everybody what they want and telling them about how these other people are trying to mess up your good thing and and pitting cities and locals against one another, which was very effective for for him, uh, but very destructive to us. And so, uh, Los Angeles musicians tended to get. Uh, activists first because some of those people had the most at stake because of the way residual funds work, which I should probably do as a little slight tangent. Um, so when you play on a record, you get paid, but you also get a residual check once a year based on how many sessions you've done in the previous five years with the, the previous year getting full credit and then it, it descends, you get 80% credit for the year before, 60, 40, 20. And that five year window moves forward. So when you get busy as a session player, it begins to manifest itself in this check you get the first week of August called the special payments check. There's a film equivalent to that with the difference being that the special payments phono check, as we call it, is based on the amount of work you've done and it is financed by, it, by it, the money that goes into the fund is from sales, but you're not tied directly to the sales of that record. So whether you did four sessions for an artist whose record never came out because he had a problem with the record label, or you play on Michael Jackson's Thriller, it's not based on the sales. The better albums do, the more they pay into the fund. And needless to say, the fund over the past decade has become challenged because record sales are not what they were. But it still distributes, you know, seven, eight million dollars a year. And, it, and back in the day, it was even more. But there's an equivalent in the film world called the Film Secondary Markets Fund. And <coughs> unlike the phono film, uh, the phono fund, it is tied to the success of that movie. So if you played on Titanic, for example, you're one of the 90 musicians, you know, you got probably a 65, 70 piece string orchestra. You got the five piece Irish band that played downstairs. You got the four violinists that went across, all over. And then you've, and then you've got the people that played on the salon scene, Celine Dion record and a few other people, probably 90 to a hundred musicians. Well, those musicians share in 1% of the revenue of that movie once it leaves the theaters from all time. So, you know, Titanic is always getting played on cable TV and, and back in the days of DVD rentals and stuff. So the L.A. musicians were connected, you know, people who had played on, you know, 15, 20 films a year for 15 to 20 years built up some serious, you know, uh, amounts in in the film fund because the film fund you know pays out a lot of money i think last year it was in the neighborhood of 80 million dollars paid out to musicians even from that one percent and so the la musicians had the most at stake and so they were the first ones to start you know uh, uh really trying to do something because what happened was the afm was not handling its money very well and rather than be frugal in what they were doing they just said hey let's tax the royalty funds. And philosophically and ethically, that was wrong because we already did the work and we paid the work dues on the work. And that's our that was our money. It was not the union's money. The union is involved in the distribution of that money, but they get a piece for that. But they just were like, oh, if we just 2% on all the recording musicians, you know, we're going to, uh, it's going to be awesome because there's not enough of them to stop us. And so it was basically kind of taxation without representation, literally. And so I was a little late to the party. I started getting involved 2004, 2005. And one of the things about the structure of the union is you have local chapters. So there's a chapter in Memphis, there's a chapter in Nashville, there's one in Indianapolis, you know, and, and New York City, L.A. And, but there's also what they call player conferences, which are in individual um, groups within the union, like the Theater Musicians Association, for the theater people who work in musical theater, and Ixom, which is the larger orchestras, they have a conference, and then Ropa, which is the regional smaller orchestras, and there was also one called the RMA, the Recording Musicians Association, and I became president of the Nashville RMA. At the time I took over, there was about 22 people, and it was kind of we weren't a very effective organization. And I, it was in the early days of email, and unlike the people here in the office at that time where that stuff was all kind of brand new and scary, 
I was able to start networking our buddies and say, hey, guys, you know, we got a problem here. And so we built up the Nashville RMA to almost 200 members in a fairly short period of time. And we just started showing up and asking questions and going, why, why is our union taxing us? You know, like, why don't you guys just learn how to handle your money? No offense kind of stuff. And, and it was complicated by the fact that our local officers here, and there's only two offices, um, were both international board members. And so they were, they were had subscribed to the theory, uh, you know, that espoused by the then president, which was kind of, you know, talking about greedy recording musicians and, 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 you know, all this rebellion when all we were really trying to do was ask questions and find out what was really going on and, and, and why this was the only solution they could come up with as opposed to learning how to handle their money or evolving. And, and, and this, the best way to put it really is, is that they kind of forgot who was working for who. It sort of felt like we were working for them to keep them in the manner in which they were accustomed. And it really started to feel very oppressive. And uh, things started to build up and build up, and it just got to a point towards the end of 2008 where um, we, you know, were, were being very frank with our criticism, and it was not being well received. And... Our intentions were good, and we tried to take the high road as much as we could, but it got a little ugly, and it just got obvious that we needed a change here. The guy who had been president here is a great musician. I had worked with him a lot over the years, you know, but he was the same age as my dad, you know, and it was time for a generational change. In every other organization, all up and down Music Row, and the record labels, publishing companies, everything, our generation had already kind of assumed our responsibilities, and we were not able to do that here. So I ran against uh, Harold Bradley, who had been president here for 18 years, and it was a very difficult decision, but it was just one of those things that somebody had to do something, and in terms of where I was at in my life at that point, I, I was ready to attempt a major career shift, uh, you know, come hell or high water. And so much to everyone's surprise, uh, we won the election and we defeated, it was the first time in the history of the AFM that two standing national officers had been defeated in their home local. It had never happened before. And so it, it was kind of the old, uh, you know, it was the spark that, that started the fire. And so about a year later in New York City, the same thing happened where the president of RMA New York, uh, pr a trumpet player who'd been in the trenches working on the Broadway shows uh, named Tino Gagliardi. Tino ran against the established leadership there and also won. And so suddenly we had leverage. We had New York, Nashville, and L.A. on the same page for the first time in a long time. And so at the 2010 convention, we, we ran a unity ticket and we looked at the existing members of the International Executive Board, and we, we had identified the guy that we felt like was probably the only one who had the, <clears throat> excuse me, the cachet to, to run against the president uh, of, of the AFM, a guy named Tom Lee uh, was the president, and we identified the president of the Dallas-Fort Worth local as the guy that we felt like would listen to us and consider making a run. And his name is Ray Hare, and uh, Ray listened to us and thought about it, and he said yes. And so we put together a, a, a ticket, you know, and we ran and and we won, and we voted out the president, vice president, four out of five board members, and suddenly I was an international officer of the AFM, and you know, and him. This is all, I just wanted to be an abandoned people like. <laughs> you, know, you remember that? It's like what kind of like what were you thinking, Dave? Kind of stuff, and. It was very interesting because we were pretty happy and we were celebrating. And about 10 minutes into the celebration, we get a phone call. The lawyers would like to meet with you, you know, the AFM's counsel. They would like to meet with all the new, newly elected officials. And so, so we go into this room and we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they're excited and go, well, you guys are going to run out of money in probably six to eight weeks unless you make some major changes. And it was like, oh, Okay, party over. Let's get to work. And we literally 
went to work that night and and uh we cut a million dollars from the budget and we went from being a million dollars in the red to a million dollars in the black in about a year and a half just by making the hard decisions that had to be made by quitting wasting money on stupid things by not fighting ourselves which is what we'd been doing for the better part of a decade you know and it was like how are we going to be strong to the outside world if we can't get along which is our whole thing of calling it the unity team and so it's been a very interesting experience it's given me a new appreciation for how amazing Nashville is and my role is a lot like being a bass player in a band you know there's always people flying off one side or the other and the bass player brings them to the middle and tries to make them feel good about everything and and so it's been a very interesting journey and we've been able to stay um you know, at a time when other locals, even New York and L.A., are seeing work go down as people, you know, find workarounds to, to get out, try to get out of working with union contracts. But bottom line is what the union is about is respect. That's what we do. We promote respect for musicians and the work they do and the intellectual property they create. Uh, we just recently uh, got Mazda to pay 12 musicians, six of whom are still alive, six of whom are deceased and their beneficiaries got paid for an ad campaign that ran for all of last year featuring a Patsy Cline record that was cut in 1962 back in baby's arms and and I'm watching football and I'm like I hear it once and I go huh that's wild and the second time I hear it go I don't think that's a sound alike and the third time I hear it like that is definitely not a sound alike I can hear Harold Bradley's tic tac bass and so I called Harold my predecessor who we now we we mended our fences and I call, hey, Harold, you got, got information on that? Because he was famous for his date book, having everything written down, handwritten. And, oh, yeah, he calls me back 10 minutes later. September 10th, 1962, here are the names. Had all the names of everybody that played on it, where it was recorded. And we go to the pension fund, get a contract, verify that everything Harold gave me was correct, and then uh, submit it to Mazda. And those players and their beneficiaries made 10 times what they made in 1962, which is just awesome. We had a 90-year-old violin player named Soli Fott came in to pick up his check. And I mean, we had the greatest conversation. I took a picture of him and me and his check. And and it's that's what we do. People go, what does the union do? I don't know. They just beat people up and, you know, break their legs. And it's like, no, we get people paid. Is that okay? Is that positive enough for you? <laughs> but, but there was definitely a stereotype. And I think it still exists to some degree that the union is, you know, we just tell people what they can't do. And, and we're an impediment. And if there's one thing that I'd like to leave behind as my legacy is that people now know that is not what we do. We are facilitators in working things out. And, you know, rather than point fingers and tell people what they can't do, we want to embrace and bring people towards us. And, and it's always refreshing when you see the light bulb go off on somebody's head and they go, wow, I didn't know that was what the union did. It's like, yeah. <laughs> So that's the kind of short version of, of what the Musicians Union does. But it, it, is, it is really a, a great organization. We've had our challenges for sure. But I think, uh, you know, the work speaks for itself. And we, we got, I think we had about $11 million in wages come through here last year, you know, through our little teeny four-person recording department. And, uh, you know, I negotiate the Grand Old Opry contract. Uh, we just got the Opry to pay for satellite radio for the first time ever, and they're now paying for YouTube videos for the first time ever. And uh, I negotiate the Nashville Symphony contract, and symphony musicians are definitely a different breed, and it's been a real education getting to know them, getting to see kind of their worldview, because I left that world in seventh grade when I traded in my string bass for a Gibson, you know. Uh, but I have incredible respect for classical musicians and what they do, and... Uh, so I'm very honored to represent folks and and try to pay it forward because I've had an amazing experience, uh, you know, being here. And, and, you know, like I said, my education was very gradual, but I see young people coming in and they ask good questions and and we're able to give them good answers. Because a lot of times the answer was, well, we'll check on that, get back to you and then never get back to you. And that always drove me crazy. So we've, we've had a lot of fun with it. And we got a good team of people here. That's the main thing. We have a good team of people here in this building and everybody gets it and that that alone the attitude 
that we project makes a big difference. It used to feel like there was a moat around the building and you couldn't come in unless you knew the password and you had friends in high places and, and all of that. And, and we don't do that anymore. And, and I don't think anybody ever intentionally did that, but that was the way it kind of came across. So can anybody, any of the local guys here, can they just walk in and talk to you guys? Absolutely. When you're open? Absolutely. And, you know, we have more and more information available about reasons to join. And because everybody kind of has their own uh, thing. We've done a lot of work for the guys that work down on Lower Broadway uh, in those clubs, most of whom are not union members. Because Tennessee's a right-to-work state, no one has to join the union. And that, to me... I mean, you can look at it as a negative, but I'm, I tend to be a pretty positive person. And I see it as that means that we have to do a good job in explaining to them why they would want to be in the union. And then it's a no-brainer. So we, we got the city to put up musician loading zone signs so that musicians have the same rights as a guy driving a beer truck. Uh, and then a couple of years ago now, when the city changed the downtown and, and widened the sidewalks, we're part of that discussion, and, and they decided, okay, we're, instead of having sporadic loading zones, we're going to make the entire 5th to 1st a loading zone. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is, is that the taxi cabs don't obey the law, and they use that outside line, uh, lane as a taxi stand. So I do everything from turning in pictures of taxis behaving badly to going to downtown merchants meetings. Uh, we just came up with a scenario where we now have $5 parking for union members downtown, which saves them a lot of money uh, over, you know, if it's an event night and tickets are 25, 30 bucks, the McKendry uh, street garage uh, on sixth and commerce. And uh, it was a premier parking and they, they stepped up and gave us uh, the ability to give our members this discount, which has brought in more people, um, you know, but it's kind of like, I'm not going to sit around with a lasso and try to drag people in here. Uh, and, and yes, there are people who take advantage of what we do and don't pay for it. And if there was enough of those people, uh, we will eventually no longer exist. And so it is a problem. It is a challenge because there are those who know damn well they should be paying us for what we do. We, we ask for, because we're not allowed to demand a non-member service fee. I mean, we're not allowed to restrict anyone's employment. We're not allowed to restrict the way they get paid. So we might as well make the best of it and just smile and be nice and hope that they'll figure it out. Yeah, you know and, it's the right thing to do. And, yeah. Right, and if we need to explain it a couple more times before they get it, we can do that. <laughs> and again, it's like everybody has a different, you know, internal hook that's going to respond to something, you know. And so because like road guys for years are like, oh, man, you don't ever do nothing for me. And it's like, I get it. I was on the road for 14 years. You didn't do much for me, although that TV show that I got paid on was pretty awesome. But like we start telling people, well, hey, have you ever done one of those Sirius XM satellite radio broadcasts? And they say, well, yeah. Uh, did you get paid for it? Well, no. Were we supposed to get paid for that? And it's like, yeah, but you have to tell us. And then we call the management and say, excuse me, uh, you know that what they're getting paid to do the gig is what gets them to the gig and do the show for the people and then go home. It doesn't pay for them to give something to SiriusXM. That's their intellectual property. It's now a recording session, and you need to pay for that. And we'll go get them paid. And I love getting people paid. It's my second favorite thing besides playing the bass. <laughs> I imagine you've played a lot of different basses. A lot of different kinds, a lot of different styles. What's your favorite? Oh, boy. That's, that's a tough question. Besides think, your 1967 Gibson. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I do love that. Um, I, I would say the bass that I'm best known for, uh, that's kind of my signature, if you like, is a electric upright bass that a guy named Harry Fleischman built for me in 1982. Um, when I was living in England, and I've always loved all kinds of music, and, and you know, as I... I started out playing rock and roll, and then I got into, like, prog rock, which led me to jazz, which led me to, you know, Chick Corea and Stanley Clark and some of those people. But I got hip to a German label called ECM Records, where it was, there, there was an American record label called CRT, where it was a jazz label, and ECM was like a kind of chamber jazz label. But it was one of those labels where, like, Every rec you could buy almost any record they put out, and you knew kind of what it was going to be like. You knew it was going to be good. You knew it was going to sound great. And I got hip to this bass player from Germany named Eberhard Weber, uh, with a W, pronounced with a V. And I, when I was living in London, I had one of his albums, and I just he had this beautiful sound. He was playing this electric stand-up bass, and at the time, Jaco Pistorius uh, was like the bass player 
that everybody was trying to copy and emulate, and he was very unique and very incredible on fretless bass. And and for some reason, I've always wanted to zig when others zagged. It was kind of like by buying a Gibson when a lot of guys were doing Fenders. And so I was, because Eberhard had this sound that was almost trombone-like. It was very sonorous and, and had a lot of sustain. It was very rich, and it just had this beautiful tone and I saw him play and he was fronting a band you know you never at that time it was pretty rare he was fronting the band sitting on a stool playing this crazy looking stand-up electric uh, with a piano player and a drummer and a saxophone player but it was definitely his band his music and I just fell in love with that sound I just sort of made a mental note in myself well you know someday in fantasy land I would love to have a bass like that and it was about it was mid uh, early 1982 and before there was a bass player magazine, there was a guitar player, and they would occasionally throw a bone to bass players and do an article. Or In this case, it was in the new products uh, section, and there was this picture of this electric stand-up bass. And it didn't look just like Everhard Weber's, but it was close enough to where I went, hmm. And I called the guy, and Harry uh, Fleischman, and he was living in Denver at the time, and I, and we talked a little bit, and I even, I think he played for me a little bit over the phone. And, and... And I said, have you ever heard of Eberhard Weber? And he said, oh, yeah. And I don't know if he had or not, but it was a good enough answer for me. And, and as luck would have it, we were on tour with Don Williams playing just north of Denver a few, month or two later. And so I said, hey, I'm going to be out your way. You know, would you mind bringing up a bass for me to play? And, and so he came to the gig and came to my hotel room and brought this bass out. And it was, again, ooh, kind of that moment of just, oh, my God, I, played a few notes, and it was like, oh, man, wow. And it was way more money than I'd ever spent on an instrument, ever. And I had, you know, uh, a wife and, and one kid and another one on the way. And and so I went to Don, and he unbelievably helped me by paying for half of it, and we split it. And so Harry, and it was a custom build. Harry had only, and he only, ended up only making about a half dozen of these, and he kind of moved into another area. But I got a five string with a with a low B, which in 1982 was not unheard of, but very unusual. And so, six months later, or however long it took him to build it, it finally arrives, and I played it for a night. And I just I got scared. I just got scared. I was like, what, what was that? I can't play this. What am I doing? I haven't played string bass since I was in fifth grade. What am I? Oh my god, what am I doing? And and so I kind of got scared and I put it away and then I thought, no, nah, man, you got to learn how to play this thing, man. And so I just, and Don was very gracious. I took it on the road and I would, for certain songs, I would use that bass and, you know, a lot of open strings and gradually got more comfortable with the intonation and learning how to play it. And and it was really just a self-indulgent thing for me. I wanted to sound like Eberhard Weber. And, of course, no one had ever heard of him, so everybody thought I invented this thing. And if I had a nickel for every country music fan that would come up and go, what is that? And I go, it's a bass. Don't look like any bass I've ever seen. I used to think, oh, I'd have a card to explain to people what it is. <laughs> but the coolest thing happened. I just kept playing it and I was using it on my own stuff and you know I had bands and things and so I got to the point where I was pretty comfortable on it and Don's co-producer was a guy named Garth Fundus and he uh, started to branch out and he had the opportunity to produce a singer named Keith Whitley and and so I show up at the studio and I bring at that point I probably had maybe six basses I didn't have a whole lot of instruments I had to I had uh, my Fender-ish basses, uh, G&L and a Yamaha and, and uh, the Gibson that I never used. And, uh, and, then, and then I brought the Beast, and, and, and that kind of became its nickname because it, it's, cause it's weird looking, and it has a bunch of pickups, and over the years, my engineer buddy Dave Cinco and I have added stuff to it, so it's kind of, at one point we were calling it Frankenstein, but it just seemed a little too much, so we call it the Beast. And... and um, and it was one of those things where I heard Keith's voice, and he's singing in this low baritone register. And it's very interesting because he he came up in the bluegrass world, and he was singing the high lonesome stuff. But Garth heard his voice and went, you know what, we can pitch this down a little bit, and it's going to be... And it was a little more Don Williams-esque, but with much more... Like, Don was never a lick kind of singer. He would sing the melody of the song very literally, and it was his conviction and phrasing that made it work. With Keith, had a little more, he was more of a, a improv guy, and he 
and and I just heard the sound of his voice, and in my mind, I just went, wow, the beast would sound great with this guy's voice, and I ended up playing that on virtually the whole record. And at that time, string bass was completely obsolete in Nashville. Nobody was recording string bass except for bluegrass people because it was just, you know, sounds had changed, and the electric bass had just taken over, you know, and... And so I started playing it, and it was a sound that it was as if no one had ever heard of a fretless bass or an electric upright bass. And, and suddenly it was like there was a, the, the song, I'm No Stranger to the Rain, which was a big hit for Keith. And there was a moment in the song where he sings a line about, you know, the, tonight the rain's really coming down and everybody stops. And I did this drop, you know, very, you know, fretless bass 101. And, and. And all of a sudden, my phone just started ringing off the hook. I was like, hey, man, I heard you playing on the Keith Whitley record, man. Can you bring that bass? And Emmy Lou, when she first heard me, she, she would call it the bass from space. Will you bring the bass from space? It's like, yes, ma'am, I will. And, and uh, Emmy Lou is one of the coolest people on the planet. She's just absolutely fantastic. And um, so that bass, to answer your question... <laughs> That bass is 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 the one that is is my sound. That's my voice, and and I I love it dearly. It it doesn't fit on everything, but it when it fits, it just sits in a track in a way that a string bass doesn't and a fretless bass doesn't. It's right in between in the gray area. And I've always found, for me, that was always the fun, whether it's stylistically or uh, sonically. I, I've always felt like. The fun is in those gray areas between the styles. I, I just, I was never a purist when it came to that. So that bass for sure, um, you know, I, and I have, I now have quite a collection. I, I had, uh, I had a house fire in 2009 and I lost a few bases in that fire. I, at that time I had about 50 uh, bases and I lost, I think, 10 in the fire, which was dreadful. But, you know, I also lost my dog in the house fire, which frankly was worse than everything else. Um, but there's a happy ending to that, um, cause he's on my new record, which is kind of fun, but we'll get to that. Uh, so, um, after, after the fire, you know, I, I, I replaced those bases and, and, and I think I now have probably closer to 60. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, I mean, I, I mean, crazy stuff, uh, you know, I, I have, uh, but as far as like my go-to stuff, uh, I have GNL bases that I got in the 80s that I dearly love. Uh, the fretted, I had a fretted and fretless. And the fretless was really cool. And I would sometimes, when the beast was a little too big, I would use the GNL to, to still have that sound but be just a little tighter. And uh, the GNLs were definitely game changers for me because I could do the Fender thing and, and shut up the Fender people. And, and it had some flexibility. And, and now the fretted bass is in the Musicians uh, Hall of Fame on exhibit, which is very something I'm very proud of. Um, and over the years, you know, different, different bases would jump out at me at different times. Uh, I have, you know, a bunch of weird ones like Italian Echo Basses or Japanese Chesco Del Rey. And, you know, those are things that you use once in a blue moon, but it's like when you use them, it's like, yeah, that's the trashy sound that I want. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I have a bunch of, I have four of these Kala ukulele basses, which are lots of fun. They're little tiny things, and they have this weird uh, string uh, technology where these big, fat rubber strings have a fundamental that's gigantic on a 19 inch string it sounds like a, you know a regular fender or a string bass and so i have four of those and and they're really fun i've fretted and fretless and five string and four string and all the variations uh, i have a couple of weird ones i have a 12 you know a 12 string bass which you use about once every uh, blue moon the guy uh, tom peterson uh, who was the bass player in Cheap Trick. He was the guy who sort of brought that to the fore. And, and he actually lives here in Nashville now, a very nice man. And, um, and then I have an eight-string fretless, which is very obscure. But, it, you know, it's kind of like a sitar with octaves on it. And I use that one about once every three or four years, but it's always perfect when I use it. <laughs> and then, But I think as far as mainstream basses go, uh, I have a five-string Oliva Capolo, uh, that's a Fender jazz style that a guy named Jimmy Coppola made for me uh, in about 2006. And it's basically a handmade Fender. Uh, and it's a five string, but he did something that I thought was kind of innovative. It's a five string, but it's still the 34 inch scale instead of the 35, which normally five strings are. And so he did the 34, but in order to make the B string work, because the B string on a 34 inch bass can be very floppy sometimes, and it's just 
doesn't really have that fundamental. He would put only the B string through the body. So the B string had a little bit extra tension on it, but you still had the advantage of having it be a 34 inch scale. So it felt like a fender, but you have this really tight, fat, low B string. And I've been using that bass in the studio for my main fretted bass for quite some time. About six months or so ago, I, uh, I found a Sadowski uh, when I was in New York City. I got one of those message, messages from the universe, go to Rudy's Guitar Shop. There is something there for you, my son. You know, And i like, okay, I'm going there. So I looked at my watch, and it's like, okay, if I start walking now, it's about three miles away because I don't want to get risk getting stuck in a taxi cab. If I really walk fast, New York City style, I can get there just before they close. So I get there. And I, they had moved down to Soho from where they used to be, which was much closer to where we stay. Uh, and I, you know, was there. It was like ten minutes before closing, and I just there's like a big ring of basses, and this Sadowski four string just kind of jumped out at me, and I went, "Wow!" And I picked it up and went, "Whoa, it's really light." And then I sat down and played it. It's like, "Wow, it plays really good." And then I plugged it in. It's like, man, that sounds really good. And I, there are very few used Sadowskis around because they're really great basses, and typically, if someone spends the you know four, five, six thousand dollars that that you would spend for a new Sadowski, you don't get rid of it because you know you love it. And this apparently was a, a dentist or a doctor who had bought it, thinking he was going to learn how to play bass, and he just didn't get around to it. So it was for sale at a, a slightly better price, and and uh, so I I told the guy I said. Hold it till tomorrow morning at eleven o'clock. Let me sleep on it, and I and I went home and slept on it. And I said, "Nah, I gotta have it." And so I called him up and bought it and had it shipped here. And I've been using that as, and it's a nice companion to the Oliva Capola, which is a rosewood neck and a five string. And this is a maple neck uh, with that real bright, real bright, punchy sound that the Sadowskis are known for. So they're a nice combination. It's kind of like a, a sports car and a and a Jeep. You know, <laughs> yeah. so I have a lot of other bases that I'm sure I'm, I'm forgetting about, but um, but there, you know, it's it's just fascinating to me all the sounds you can get, and that's kind of been my mo as far as making my own records. Uh, you know, just hey, I don't need to get a drummer because I can make a bass sound like a drum. Yeah, and speaking of all these different bases that you can make sound like all different things, let's talk about the all bass orchestra. Yeah. I, I've seen some videos of that, and it's just so impressive. I want to... That that was, again, just a totally organic, random thing that happened. So there was a guy named Richard Johnston who was writing for Bass Player Magazine, and he had reviewed several records that I'd played on, some Trisha Yearwood stuff and some other records. And so I was slightly on the radar. And then he talk to me about, hey, you know, I'd like to talk to you about your electric upright because that's kind of unusual and, and everything. And so um, Guy Clark, who, uh, you know, to circle back around to Guy, uh, Guy called me one day in about 1992 or three, I think. He called me and said, hey, uh, you need to come over. I got a song I want to play for you. And Guy Clark is not like the kind of person that pitches songs, you know. So I'm like, okay. So I go over there to his little place over at EMI Songs, and he plays me this song, and it's just wonderful. It's a it's a, a gal playing upright bass and singing this tune called The Day the Bass Players Took Over the World. And it was just, cracked me up, and I, and I told him he had heard it at the Kerrville Folk Festival in Texas, and so he brought me back a copy. So I took it, and I worked it up, and I kind of rearranged it a little bit. I gave it a little more of a a little less of a drone thing and a little more of a harmonic structure, subtle changes. And then I, I wrote an additional bridge, uh, an original, a, additional B section to kind of address samplers and drum machines and, and things like that that she wasn't thinking about when she originally wrote the song. And so I sent it to her. I recorded a version of it with about 18, 19, 20 bases on it and doing all different things. And and so I sent it to her, and she really liked my version. And in her infinite kindness, she said, "You know what? I, I would like for you to, you know, I, I want to make you a co-writer on your version of the song. I've already had someone else record it. There was a group called Trout Fishing in America, and they had recorded it. Um, but she said, for your version, I would like for you can be twenty five percent writer and publisher, which is a very generous thing for her to do." What happened was Richard wanted to write this piece about me, and I had this song recorded, and so it. The editor of the magazine at the time, Jim Roberts, heard the song and saw the piece and said, wow, I really like this. 
let's hold it back a month and make it a bigger feature than we were going to do. It's like, okay, that's cool. And so then we get, I'm getting to know these guys a little better. And so I, I can't remember exactly how it happened, but the NAM show was coming up. And Jim and I were talking, and he, and he kind of said, well, you know, if I gave you a little seed money, you know, could you actually do like, a, like an all-bass orchestra, you know, like it's on your record? And I'm like, yeah, sure, <laughs> I can do that. Not really knowing if I could or not. He kind of called my bluff. And so he gave me some money, and we found a few sponsors so that we could afford to do it. And the first one we did was in 1995, and it, uh, it was kind of a hit. Uh, I had Dwayne Eddy as our one and only non-bass playing guest because he's like the lowest guitar player ever. And we had, I think that first year we had about 18 guys. And, you know, we had some great players. We had Michael Rhodes and Mike Bigdello and, and uh, oh gosh, you know, a bunch of great, great Nashville bass players, Roy Vogt and uh, all these guys. And so the first one was just kind of for fun to see if we could pull it off. And, you know, and we had these crazy rehearsals. And, and so we pulled it off. And then the next year... I got a little over ambitious and I tried to record and film everything and it was in the early days of the Sinclair and I was told it never crashes. The Sinclair never crashes. We'll use we'll we'll use that as our recording medium. And so sure enough, right at the beginning of the show the Sinclair crashed. Everything that could have gone wrong with that gig went wrong. I mean, we survived. Nobody got killed, but it was it was went from the potentially best night of my life to kind of a disaster. And I wasn't sure if I was ever going to try that again, but that's just my nature. So the next year, we're like, okay, we're going to do it. We're going to film it. We're going to do it right. We're going to shrink the band a little bit because we had 22 bass players that second year. And my mistake, 22 amplifiers. Hmm. That was the mistake. and uh, One of the mistakes. <laughs> and so the next year, we went for it, and it actually worked. And it became a pretty good selling video for through Bass Player Magazine. And we shared ownership. And then after the initial run, it reverted back to me. So we just recently re-released it a couple years ago as a 20th anniversary with some extra footage, including some stuff from 94 and a little bit from the infamous 95 show and then some other stuff from later. Uh, and some little some of the stuff we did with uh, Bob Babbitt and and my son, who's a filmmaker, uh, we made a little 10-minute documentary called Building the Bass Orchestra that kind of talks about how it all came together. And and so we did, we had a little reunion in 2014. We did the first one we'd done in quite a while and had Paul Simon's bass player, Bakiti Kamalo, came and we did You Can Call Me Al, which was really fun. Uh, and I sang it and played the whistle part on the electric upright with a programming, uh, you know, with a synthesizer, uh, uh, well, actually a harmonizer. And it was just so really fun. And we're going to do a smaller version here in a couple months uh, uh, for Roy Vogt's uh, bass night at Douglas Corner for NAMM coming up. Uh, uh, but, you know, it was a real organic thing. And, you know, some guys, and it, the whole idea was, okay, now we can't all play bass. You know, like, so, like, like the idea was, and it was basically set up geographically, you know, like stage left was low basses. We'd have, like, one or two guys with five strings. And then we'd have two guys with like fenders. We call them the mid-range basses, and maybe have a fretless guy there. And if, if somebody was into weird sounds, we could put them in the, over there. But so we have four basses over here, and then have four string basses, two people doing mostly rhythmic stuff, drum things, um, all kinds of percussive stuff, and maybe some rockabilly slap, and then two more like uh, bow guys or line jazz players, you know, jazz classical guys who could do some lines as well uh, with a certain amount of flexibility but kind of two and two and then we have two guys playing dan electros covering some of the guitar stuff and then we'd have two guys on like you know six seven nine string you know too many string basses to play all the high noodly stuff and so it was just kind of set up in a semicircle with me in the middle and and so you know there were times when one side and the other side they wouldn't necessarily be totally in sync but just the spectacle of it all was just so ridiculous that it became kind of a big favorite of, of Nam, And so we did it, I think, four or five years in a row and always had a lot of fun with it. And, and uh, it's just, it becomes a time and budget thing of, you know, because I'd never want people to work for free, even if it is fun, I've got to pay people. And so I think we're going to do maybe a quintet or a sextet, something around along those lines this year. I hope we'll be able to do a big one again on one of these days, but it's just quite the undertaking. <laughs> um, talk to us a little bit about your new record. 
that's coming okay. out. Okay, well, I, I will. Um, I've made, so the first solo record I did was called Bases Loaded, and it came out in 1997, and it really started, really the whole thing started with the day the bass players took over the world. Because like, okay, I got this one song I can do. Maybe I need to like have some more songs. So I started writing some instrumentals, and, um, and finding songs that other people did uh, that I could kind of, you know, interpret doing the all bass thing. And uh, so I made that record and it got some nice buzz and it was right around that same time with the bass orchestra video and things. So it kind of put me on the map in the bass world more than the mainstream world as a solo artist. And then I, I made, uh, made another one in 2003 and called Tomorrow Never Knows based on the Beatles tune. And, you know, of course, because with my uh, silly uh, brain, I decided, well, okay, I'll take a song that the Beatles recorded knowing they would never, ever have to play it on stage, ever, and figure out how to play it on stage by myself <laughs> and make it sound like the Beatles. You know, like, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> so, but I use, you know, I use effects devices and loop devices to create some of these soundscapes, or like we call them, uh, basscapes. Uh, and so each record has had a certain amount of instrumental stuff, about half and a half vocal, half and a half instrumental. And then... After the record came out in 2003, that was right around the time when the union stuff started kicking in, and I just got so busy that I couldn't, I just really didn't, I was writing the songs, doing the occasional gig, but I mean, I really, I didn't quite put the bass down, but especially the first couple years, it was just such a learning curve. Plus, my house fire happened 24 hours after I got sworn in as president. And so that I was having to learn how to do this job because our predecessors chose to give us no transition whatsoever because they were mad at us uh, for getting them out of office. So we had to learn all this and learn about rebuilding my house and contractors and all that insurance and all this crazy stuff. So those first few years were a blur, but I gradually started writing more and working on stuff. And I recorded one song in about 2007 before all, in the midst of all that, I recorded a Jesse Winchester song and that one survived. But starting about three years ago, I really started getting antsy to like try to do another record because it had been a long time. And a friend of mine named Ben Silas had called me up a few years ago and said, hey man, I, I'd love to get together and write a song, you know, okay. So he came in, you know, and there's that thing when you write a song with somebody, it's like, okay, I got an idea, you got an idea. And his idea the idea that he brought to me was really inspired by what I went through with my house fire uh, called Angel in the Ashes. And it was like, wow, that's a cool image. You know, let's, let's try to write that. So, so we wrote it and it, I felt good about it. It was kind of, you know, it felt good to get that emotion out. And I, but I just kind of let it sit for a while. And I'm not really sure exactly why, but it was like, almost like it just needed to simmer for a while. And so, I kept working, you know, and, and getting more into it. And, and I pulled that song back out about a year ago and I kind of reworked it because it needed musically, it needed to be uh, a little more interesting. It was a little bit monotone to my taste uh, harmonically. And, and so I worked out a series of modulations, uh, you know, to where, I could get from one key to another in a way that didn't feel real obvious, like the sort of standard, okay, kick it up a step, you know, is it Sinatra, you say, kick it upstairs, you know, mm -hmm. it was more like, okay, I just want to, I want to, this song needs to somehow reflect, just go a little deeper. And I looked at the lyrics and I rewrote the lyrics just a little bit to make it a little more powerful and a little more universal. And so that became the title track of the record. And, uh, it was, and, and I, so I really started, you know, kind of getting into gear this whole last year. And so, you know, I'd get done here at the, at the union and I'd go home and, uh, you know, work for a pretty good while, you know, uh, as often as I could. And I have a wonderful friend, great engineer named uh, Dave Cinco, who works with uh, people like Sam Bush, Edgar Meyer, Mark O'Connor, the Punch Brothers. I mean, he's a really incredible engineer. And Dave has helped me with all of my records and uh, over the years. And and so Dave and I, and the, the studio that we have, we share together. And it's his gear and my space and all of that. And so I really started hammering down this last year. And like I spent my whole Christmas vacation working on this, what I, because I was looking for like a, a centerpiece for the record. And I was uh, 
for a while, I've been doing the Temptations Cloud Nine as a solo thing with the loops, and it, it's just a fun song, you know, and my friend Bob Babbitt played on the original record, and so I thought about Cloud Nine. I thought, well, that's cool, but, you know, it's kind of escapism a little bit. Some people call it a drug song. I think it's about music. I, that's the way I prefer to look at it, uh, but it just felt like part i feel like i need i want to do something on a grander scale so i started just looking around at tunes from that era and so i and i and i rediscovered the temptations ball of confusion which was cut right around the same time same writer same producer same players babbitt again and it starts out with babbitt all by himself and uh and i started listening to that and i'm listening to the lyrics and going wow okay that was 46 years ago and those lyrics pretty much right on the money for today. So I started thinking, okay, Ball of Confusion, that kind of works. And I'm thinking, yeah, but it needs, okay, but I need a bridge to get between those two songs. And I, and, and I started thinking about For the Love of Money, the OJs, which Anthony Jackson played the great pick bass part and ended up one of the few times that a session player who came up with a lick actually got a writing credit, which is pretty cool. And the fact that that song has been sort of co-opted several times and used <clears throat> to try to mean something different than what it actually means, which is money is bad and it makes bad it makes people do bad things. And so <clears throat> I realized, wow, that could fit. So then I just had to come up with a skeleton and a structure to fit those songs together. And and it couldn't be the the I couldn't do all of each song because it would just be too long. So I was able to cherry pick the lyrics, keep the message, but not sing anything that I just felt fake about, you know? So I was able to to figure that out, and each one is about two and a half minutes, give or take 20 seconds. And so it starts with Ball of Confusion, and then it segues right into For the Love of Money, and then and then there's this little moment where, because the tempo and the key need to change, and I, and I wanted to make it feel like a rave thing where, you know, like that thing where it's speeding up and everybody's going, woo, 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 woo. And so I did this tempo thing, and of course I'm playing kick drum with my fist on the back of a, of a, Bass, acoustic bass guitar and so I spent a long time with this little because I had a space and it's like okay I got this much space if I do three bars and I gradually do every one a little bit faster it's going to get to the right tempo and and it did and so it's like oh god so so we were able to 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 put this skeleton together of, of eight about eight minutes long and so I just I mean I literally spent two months every spare moment for two months working on this medley and and driving myself and Dave Cinco crazy <laughs> Uh, and of course, singing all the parts of the Temptations as well, all the way from the lowest part to the high part, uh, all by myself, and and that was a challenge. And uh, just you know, and and using different voices and harmonizers to get the horn parts and all these different things uh, together. And then we we're almost done, and I start thinking about my dog. I'm thinking, you know. Because Duke was a hell of a singer. He had this thing. We discovered this when he, I was producing a record on a harmonica player friend of mine named Paco Ship for my record uh, label, Earwave. And so Paco, we were mixing Paco's record, and Duke would be asleep, and he'd start, like, howling in his sleep every time the harmonica would come on. So I started experimenting, and I got a harmonica, and I'm like, <laughs> blowing on the harmonica. And sure enough, it's like a some kind of weird muse for him. And, and any kind of sound like an accordion or anything with a reedy kind of sound. And something in there was rubbing him to where he could not control himself. So I have various tapes of me playing the keyboard and Duke singing along. There's one on YouTube. that I, I, I named it Doggy Pavarotti Wants a Biscotti, <laughs> uh, just for fun. But I had a number of recordings of Duke because uh, there was one record I produced about 10, 12 years ago where it needed a dog bark and I got one out of them. So I had these things and so I, I started looking around and I, I picked about five of the best long howls that I had and I gave them to Dave and I said, I want him, here's where I want him to go, but I'm not sure I can just, let me know when you got it to where it's a good place. And he picked two, two of them and, and it was amazing. We didn't even have to tune them up or do anything to them. They just fit. And so at the very beginning of Ball of Confusion where there's this, this like, harmonizer thing it took me a long time to figure out how they got that sound it's basically ascending fourths where it goes dun, 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 dun. they were doing it with some kind of primitive you know even tied harmonizer back in 71 so i figured out how to get that sound but then there was a space 
after these two things. And so we put Duke in there and it's just, every time I listen to it, I just go, Hey man, you made the record. Cause he was a great dog. And, you know, and, and my friends were so great. I have a friend that, that plants trees. Uh, he's planted 20,000 trees and, uh, he has an organization called Sound Forest because he's a songwriter, but he's also a nature guy. And so he planted a tree for Duke in Severe Park that's right where my street, Cedar Lane, hits 12th Avenue. Duke's tree is right there. So like, so I drive that way when I come to work. I don't go anywhere. I always go, hey, Duke, you know, roll out the window, check yourself out, man. So, you know, Duke is still with us. And he got his picture on the album cover and the inside, and, and he's uh, very audible. So, so the record was, was really, really fun. And I, and I also found w- w- what was interesting, you know, I, because there's a lot of lyrics. I, I wrote more songs than I'd ever written, as opposed to usually on the other records, more of the instrumentals are mine and the songs are, uh, most of the songs are other people's, whereas I just, like I had more to say. And so I wrote a lot of songs, but I'm listening to it after a while and I'm getting to the point where I'm mocking up the sequence and I'm thinking, you know, that's a lot of words. There's a lot of words. I think I need some, you know, little palate cleansers, as we call them. And over the years of doing these loops and sounds, you know, every time I go to set everything up and work on something, a lot of times I'll just start messing around and a sound inspires me to do something and I'll put it in the looper and go save. So I had maybe six or eight of these little pieces. And so I started going through and I picked out three of them that I thought would be really cool because my original thought had been I wanted to have little segues between every song. And then it fell into this rhythm of two vocals, one instrumental, two vocals, one instrumental. And it just kind of worked. And I was even was able to sequence songs that kind of belong together as the two vocal pieces. And, and, so it really worked out, and so I have three of these bass scapes on the record, and 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 I overdubbed. I I took them. Basically, what I did was performed them into Pro Tools in real time with the looper, because with this Roland looper that I use, the RC50, you have three loops, and you can manually stop and start them and turn them backwards and do all these things that I normally when I work up a song it's a kind of a part of the arrangement is me remembering what to push when and all that, and when it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. Um, so I, I kind of performed them into Pro Tools and then overdubbed some more colors on them. And they turned out really great. I was really happy with how they turned out. And they kind of give the music a little bit of a, uh, the lyrics a little bit of breathing room for those who would rather hear me play the bass than hear me sing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's, I think it's the best work I've ever done. And I'm getting some great initial response. Uh, bass Player Magazine is doing a little mini feature co- next, next month, and which coincides with the NAM show coming here, which is very handy timing. And my friend Jim Roberts actually wrote the piece, the guy who was the original editor of Bass Player, uh, who's still kind of an editor, uh, editor emeritus, you know, kind of, he still writes for them occasionally. So it's funny how those circles all come back around. And that's kind of the theme of the record is that it all comes back around. So again, that's called Angel in the Ashes. When when is that coming out? It's out now. Oh, it's out now. Uh, it's Perfect. out. It's on iTunes, and I will say anybody who buys it on iTunes, send me an email, and I'll send you the artwork because I'm really really happy with the artwork. I've been working with the same graphic artist since 1989, and we used a painting by a guy named Bob McGill, uh, which I bought after my house fire um, as kind of inspiration for the cover art, and it's a great painting. Uh, there was a wonderful bass player named Roy Husky Jr., who was my friend. He, he, he was in the couple of the original versions of the bass orchestra. Roy, unfortunately, died very young at 40. And after I was, you know, I was out of my house living in an apartment while it was being rebuilt, and I had a little bit of a budget to replace some of the artwork that burned up and stuff. And so I was, went into this, you know, one of the many little consignment junk stores there on Nashville. And I just looked up and I see this painting of a guy, uh, uh, an angel, playing a bass, playing a purple string bass with a bow. And it's like, and I'm looking and I go, wow, that's cool. And the painting, I don't know if you know who Howard Finster is. He's like a primitive artist. He was kind of like a preacher down in Georgia somewhere, but he has a particular style of art where there's like words on the painting or it's just very, it's very like, like nouveau primitive or something. I'm sure there's a name for it. But this guy, Bob McGill, the painter, he, I found out after the fact he paints with acrylics on wood, and he does it all with razor blades. So it's got a very distinctive style. And so I bought this painting for a pretty decent price, and he had his name on the back, so I knew who had painted it. And it was called First Base, B-A-S-E, which I thought was kind of funny and a little bit wrong, but whatever. <laughs> and so 
but I, I had it in this apartment I was living in, and and after about three or four days, I looked at it and I went, "Holy crap! It's Roy." The face of this angel looked just like my friend Roy, and I just thought, "Wow!" And he was a string bass player, but you know, never played with a bow, never had a purple bass, uh, but he definitely has angel wings. And 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 Roy is, you know, I I still I feel his presence. He he comes around sometimes when I need him the most, and and I may get a little emotional here. Um, so I look at this painting and I go, oh "My God, it's Roy!" And so I find the artist's phone number, and I call him up, I say, hey, have you ever heard of a bass player named Roy Husky Jr.? He goes, no, why? And I'm like, because you just painted him. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you didn't know it, but you totally painted him. And, and, so I, and so I hung it on the, it goes down into the studio and downstairs. So, you know, fast forward eight years later, I'm thinking about an album cover, and I've already got Angel in the Ashes as the album title in my head, and I'm starting going, starting going well, damn, we, we need to get Roy in this thing. So... So my art guy, uh, you know, I sent him a picture of the of the, uh, the the painting, and and he built the whole album cover around the colors and themes of that painting, and so it all fits together. So as much as I love for people getting it on iTunes, uh, I encourage anybody to send, I'll send them the art because we're really really happy with the art. And it's like an eight page book with me expounding about all kinds of things, and a nice picture of Duke and my cat Cleopatra as well. But it's also available. The best place to get it for me is uh, DavePomeroy.com. That's P-O-M-E-R-O-Y. And, um, and we've got, I, I think this is the 15th project I put out on my label. Um, and we, our slogan is uh, Real Music for Real People because it's uh, meant to be, you know, it's not mainstream stuff by any means. All of my records uh, tend to be a little bit all over the place. But, you know, most of the people I know like more than one kind of music. So uh, I'm really happy with uh, the response and, uh, you know, looking forward to selling bunches of them. That's so great. And is your email address on your website somewhere? Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, probably the best one is earwave at AOL.com. And, uh, yeah, and earwavemusic.com goes straight to the store, but it's all part of DavePomeroy.com. And there's quite a bit of stuff on their website. There's a lot of the videos that we've done over the years and things, you know, stuff like this and, and uh, pictures of me playing with some fun people and a few videos and all that. But uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, to me, this was more than anything a personal statement that I wanted to get out, uh, you know, just as a, as a creative release because I do so much crazy administrative stuff with the union world that the base is my therapy and my sanity and all of that and so to, to actually take it to completion and have it uh turn out really I, I i can't imagine how i could have done anything very different you know uh, i mean dave and i have a great relationship together uh as far as just you know knowing how far to push each other you know and with him you know giving me feedback on performance and me driving him crazy with mixed stuff and, you know, well, what if, and we could do, and editing and, and, you know, and I, I did a lot of the work alone and then, you know, would bring him in and, but we mixed everything together and, and, um, uh, you know, he's a fantastic guy and I'm just happy to have something out there to remind people that I'm not just like the union thug that, you know, people want to believe. Right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So angel in the ashes, angel in the ashes. And I think it's, if you just go to DavePomeroy.com forward slash angel, it goes right to that page. And there's some samples on there and people can listen to all the different stuff. And uh, I'm sure we'll be running some kind of a, a sale here before long where if people want to buy more than one thing, we give them a discount. And, you know, because I, I mean, I recognize that physical product is, is not exactly uh, at its peak, but I don't know, you know, I'm a tactile guy. I like to look at it. I like the booklet. And I, I'm really pr happy with the artwork and the photography. Great uh, photographer named Jim McGuire, who's taken some of the greatest pictures in Nashville history, uh, is now retired. And this photo shoot the, for the front and back cover, I think, was the last photo shoot he's ever going to do. Uh, unless somebody really dangles an awful lot of money in front of him. He's very happily retired. and I, I've known him for a long time. I'm very honored to to take pictures in front of that backdrop that so many great artists, you know, everybody from Johnny Cash to Billy Graham to, to you know, 20 year old Vince Gill have posed in front of that backdrop. So I feel very fortunate. All right. Dave Pomeroy therapy sessions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> available on iTunes. Indeed. Um, well, to be respectful of, of your time and our time, um, we're going to 
start to wrap things up here. Sure. In a bit. Lightning round. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try. I'll do my best. Perfect. Keep it short. <laughs> um, right before we get to the, the super, the quick questions. Sure. What do you have, um, just last words of advice for musicians um, that want to make it in Nashville? It's a big, scary city. What um, what are some of the, the key th ingredients that they need in order well, to succeed? Well, you know, I, it's a great question, and, and thank you for asking it. I would say the number one thing is to trust yourself. Listen to your instincts. You know, there's a voice inside of you that speaks, and if you don't listen to that voice, it will eventually stop speaking. Most of the momentous decisions of my life have been things that on paper didn't make sense. That, you know, I just, moving to London knowing no one. That's, but I didn't, I, I just, something told me I needed to do that. It's just like something told me to go to Rudy's and see if they had happened to have a wonderful base that day. I mean, so I, I you have to b trust yourself, believe in yourself, but be honest with yourself as well. And, and look at your strengths and your weaknesses. And figure out what they are. And if the weaknesses are things you need to get better at, then get better at them. Or if they're just things you need, you know, I, I'm not going to be that. You know, I'm not going to be the oboe player in the Nashville Symphony. I know that. Um, you know, so I think a big part of it is, is, you know, that self-awareness and, and the belief. In your, because, you know, people will test you by saying, no, no, no. I, I, they listen to three seconds of your song go, no, nah, I'm not interested. No, nah, what else you got? Okay, that's it. Well, all right, you know, kid, you know, better go home and, you know, just go home and, you know, go back to college or whatever. And there, sometimes people will do that just to test you. And then if you come back six months later and you've got another song, say, so, you know, well, I remember what you said last time and, uh, you know, here's a song I really feel good about and, and you know, or, or whatever that might be. I mean, but like the most off the wall stuff, like these bass recordings have led to more recognition that I ever would have dreamed possible, you know, and and in the weirdest way. So I think, you know, you, you have to be open minded, but really you must you 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 must believe in yourself and 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 I think that's the single most important thing, but also is is is, you know, really dig down and, and do your research, you know? Do your research and meet people and and as silly as it sounds, be nice. Because if you and another person are equally talented and you're nice and they're not, they're going to hire you. People skills are really, really important because there are many, many qualified musicians to do any particular job. But what people, you know, you know people want to hire somebody they want to hang out with. I mean, that doesn't mean you have to, you know, kiss butt and be you know, like all, you know, be some kind of sycophant. You don't have to do that. I mean, it, but it, it is about, I, I think, you know, truly being open-minded, being honest with yourself and, and trusting your gut instinct. I think those are skills that w will help you no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing. But, you know, Nashville is geographically a very tight place, even though there's all these people coming here. It's still you know, when the traffic's not bad, one side or the other is 20 minutes to, to the edge of town. It's very different from New York and L.A. They're very fragmented. London is an amazing city, but also very fragmented. There's nowhere on earth that is as concentrated geographically as Nashville is in terms of opportunities in the music business. And I can't tell you how many people I know who are booking agents, who are publishers, who came here to be a musician, and their path took them somewhere else. And if they just said, no, 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 I'm... I'm I'm going to be the next Roy Clark. I'm going to be the next Brent Mason. I'm going to be the next Mark O'Connor. I'm going to be the next Sam Bush. Whatever. It, 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 they became something else. And But I think one of the things that makes Nashville interesting is, is that you have these people who actually have been musicians, even if they're no longer musicians. And don't underestimate that even though it's big and scary, it's a small town. And word travels fast. Good word and bad word. And, you know... Every gig is important. doesn't matter if there's three people in the audience. That one person might be the guy who's going to change your life. And if you just go through the motions, that ain't going to happen. So you've got to give it all. You've got to give, give your all, all the time. All right. So our, some quick questions that we have. Okay. Um, Lightning round. Lightning round, yeah. Here we go. Who Good do luck. you currently reach out to when you need advice? Good question. Um, 
I have a friend in D.C., a guy named Chuck Underwood that I grew up with. Uh, actually, we, we met when we were teenagers. We were in a band for, together for one year. Uh, not even one year. We were actually in a band together for a summer. But he and I just hit it off. And he's like my jazz He's a great guitar player, great jazz musician, and so like he's like the jazz police. If I have a musical question about, hey, can I can I play this against that? Does that work? It seems like it works, and he'll give me the theoretical explanation of why it works or not. And and so Chuck is a go to guy. Um, you know, I diff, different people for different things. A lot of times, it's not so much advice as it is perspective, mm-hmm. where you maybe find an answerly uh, important person, and you're, if you're having a, a problem with a particular situation, particular person, you know, you go to somebody who's at least marginally familiar with both sides and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going through this and just, I'm thinking about this as an approach. What do you think? So I think friends are important. Um, and, and, you know, and people you've known a long time, people, uh, you know, because sometimes, you know, when you get to a certain amount of notoriety, you have the problem of people just telling you what they think you want to hear rather than really being honest with you. It's like, you know, hey, how's this shirt? You know, well, man, I don't know. It kind of makes it look like I get a beer belly. You know, like nobody's going to say that. They're going to go, oh, man, that's awesome. It's great. You know, and I would rather have somebody go, man, that's not a great shirt for you. You know, I mean, that's a silly example, but it's that same thing. I, I think you, uh, you know, friends can be mentors and, and it's a two-way street too, you know, and, and I think really that's, again, it's relationships. So I think it's the people you have the longest and deepest relationships with, you can get advice on almost anything. And even if it's not in their wheelhouse, they're going to give you that heart to heart kind of perspective, which I think is really more important than technical details. Absolutely. Who comes to mind when you think of the word successful? Um, hmm. I would say Jack White, Dan Auerbach, in terms of, you know, guys, certainly in terms of, of Nash- coming to Nashville and making their thing work in Nashville. Um, but gosh, um, boy, I should have researched that one because <laughs> I know I'm going to miss some people. Um, y- you know, I would say, uh, gosh, Sam Bush, very inspiring, you know, totally created his own world. Um, you, you know, I think, I guess it really comes down to definitions of success. You know, I admire people that have great families, have a great personal life and balance that. Rob Ikes, he would be one of, maybe at the top of my list, uh, one of the greatest Dobro players on the planet Earth, but also a great person with a great family who's totally got his act together. Uh, we're, we have a band together called Three Ring Circle with uh, Andy Leftwich, and Andy's another great guy who grew up in White House, Tennessee, yet has this incredible musical vocabulary, you know, from Django, uh, gypsy jazz, to classical stuff. Uh, and I don't know where in the heck he learned all that stuff up in the White House. I've been to White House. It's not, you know, I didn't see the Django, gypsy, or classical music school up there. Uh, but, yeah, Rob, Rob, to me, is a gr- great example of a guy who has created his own universe. He has his own record label. He has his own Dobro instructional festival. Uh, called Rezo, Rezo Summit that they have every year, and he brings in all the other great Dobro players of the world. He's not competitive with anybody. He would be somebody I would definitely say that for. Uh, there's a friend of mine named Guthrie Trapp, who's a very interesting, uh, young-ish, compared to me, certainly guitar player. I've known Guthrie since his late teens, totally self-taught, totally making it up as he goes along, uh, and now runs a, a, a successful... A music school, uh, like a finishing school for college graduates who didn't get the real world part of the education in their musical college called Segway 61. And he is, you know, he's, again, he's created his own universe that, you, you know, you, that, that you can't, there's not really a precedent for that. I would say Guthrie and, and Rob are people I really admire. Um, you know, my, my, uh, to me, to me, success is about it's not just about your accomplishments. It's about your happiness in, in life and you're putting good stuff out there as a person. And I'm sure I've forgotten a lot of other people, but to me, it's, it's not just how many notes can you play. It's, it's what are you saying with those notes and what are you doing with your life? And that's why the union thing is important to me and I'm very passionate about it because, you know, they took great care of me. You know, I'm going to have a pension uh, because I'm in the union. And I did a lot of work that was done under union contracts. And, and 
to teach young musicians how important that is and to you know be able to pay a guy that's 90 years old for some work he did 53 years ago those things to me that defines success so i i uh, I, I'm, uh, but that's a really, a really great question. I think success is really happiness and, and being comfortable with who you are and not trying to pretend you're something you're not. Great answer. Okay. Great answer. Absolutely. Uh, what is something that you're trying to improve in your life? Well, that's a good question. My health a little bit, just because I'm, I'm more aware of it. Uh, you know, as your body gets older, it starts messing with you a little bit. And so I'm definitely more aware of my health. I think I'm, uh, I've learned how to be a better listener. Uh, that's something I was not very good at as, as a young man. I think I just plowed my way into situations and, and uh, was so busy telling everybody how cool I was, I didn't really understand how cool they were. Um, I think from a spiritual standpoint, I'm, I'm a little more in tune, I think, with that side of things. Uh, uh, you, you know, and just, you know, whether you call it Christianity, Christianity or karma or... Uh, you know, do unto others, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different ways to look at it, but just wanting to live a life that um, is as hypocritical uh, as, as least often as possible, because I, I don't want to say one thing and do another right. and just trying to be an honest, real person and, and being willing to take a minute and try to help somebody who is floundering. You know, I, I sometimes maybe I jump in there a little too easily and they were just doggy paddling and I didn't, I thought they were drowning, but uh, you know, just try to pay it forward. I think that's a better way of putting it. You know, to, to me, it, whether it's, you know, helping a little old lady across the street or uh, loaning somebody an instrument because for something that, you know, I uh, just what, whatever it might be. But, but yeah, I, I mean, I figure we're all work in progresses and, uh, you know, we just, I just lost a friend of mine to this morning, a uh, guy that I've known for 30 years who's had Parkinson's for more than 20 years. And he was so incredibly determined and tough through that whole process. And this morning he fell down the stairs and broke his neck. And it was inevitable that something was going to happen. I I'm, I'm feel grateful that he didn't suffer uh, as, as much as he has been suffering because he is just to get across the room has been a struggle. And his name was Jimmy Knowles, uh, N A L S. He played in a band called Sea Level. That was that was probably his best known thing. Uh, it was a spinoff of the Almond Brothers, and they made some great records uh, back in the late seventies, early eighties. And so, you know, you give thanks for people like that in your life. And I'm so glad that I knew him. And it was a random encounter, you know, years ago when I was on the road and he was playing with someone I never would have thought he would have played with. And I just happened to hear him get introduced. And I went up to him after the show and said, wow, I'm a big fan. You ever want to come to Nashville? Let me know. I'd help you any way I can. And this is way before I was doing anything like this. And and so I'm I'm grateful. You know, I'm, I'm grateful for all of it. I, I've been incredibly blessed in my life. And, uh, you know, I hope I get to enjoy a lot more. I'm, I'm very grateful my parents are still alive. They're 91 and 88. They just celebrated their 68th wedding anniversary and they're wow. both relatively sane and of sound body. And, <laughs> it's amazing. And so, yeah, I, you know, my, my life is wonderful and, and, and I still get to play the bass. So That's great. It's good. That's so great. Well, thank you so much for taking you the bet. time out. Hey, just a few more things before you take off. First of all, you can find links to everything we discussed in the show notes. This episode was brought to you by our wonderful patrons. If you want to learn more about becoming part of the Patreon family and how you can unlock behind the scenes content, you can find us at patreon.com forward slash inside music city. If you enjoy this episode, you can go to our Facebook page and let us know. You can comment on posts, pictures, videos, anything really. We love talking to you. Our Facebook is inside music city and be sure to give us a like. And finally, please, please, please forward this episode to someone you feel like would enjoy listening to or learning from our conversation today. And again, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. You're awesome. Awesome.